My delicious co-creators, Lilu here from Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada with Diedrich today. Hello, Diedrich. Hello, Lilu. How are you? Very good. <coughs> it's good to be here and again having another juicy conversation. You have a very extraordinary story that I think can inspire a lot of people. and That's why we're here and that's why we were synchronistically led to spend this moment with you and share this with as many people as possible. Uh, from my understanding, you had quite a tough half part of your life until you were 50. You faced quite a lot of challenges and mm -hmm. now you have this whole new life that has opened up, but it required a lot of healing and uh, nurturing and love to accept what you've been going through and what you put yourself in, what the position that you put yourself in mm -hmm. throughout all these years. Can you tell us about your, your, your story <coughs> and about your childhood and how you came to be this, yeah, this person um, that was addicted to some substances and alcohol? Many substances, uh, many addictions. Um, yeah, the story started uh, at birth when I was um, interned in uh, Japanese camps for three and a half years. And after that, spent time in Indonesia in a war-torn zone. And after that, went to a foster home. And um, the result of all these was a very deeply held belief in unworthiness and guilt. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and with that, I led a life of uh, self-hatred and a projection of that self-hatred on everything and everyone around me to the point of uh, severely abusing alcohol, drugs, uh, all kinds of other issues that were extremely self-limiting and sabotaging. And then I got to the point, as you said, about uh, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, where either something had to change or I was going to finish yeah. um, my short stay on this little planet. And then I came across this work, I took a year off, did nothing but meditate, <coughs> study, in, incorporate, integrate, and did uh, an enormous amount of forgiveness for all the beliefs that I had created around myself. So who I was was a whole set of beliefs that were extremely negative and extremely uh, full of hatred and loathing and shame and guilt. And the process has been to recognize, first of all, recognize that that's not who I am. Yeah. And second of all, recognize that who that person seems to be can be completely transformed. And that is the foundation of our work. So whoever comes to our center comes with a similar, not the same story, but a similar package of beliefs. And the first thing we do is tell them who you think you are is not who you are. Yeah. And who you think you are is available to you any time you're ready to choose that. Uh -huh. So that's why we call choose again. You constantly choose. Yeah, we constantly choose, but I guess there's this moment for a person to realize where they're at because there's this denial that happened, mm -hmm. I guess, for you. Were you in denial for that many years? Or what were you actually, what are the battles when you're in that phase before you really take on a program that can work and make a real difference? Well, there really wasn't a battle. There was more uh, an absolute um, lack of awareness that there was another way. It just seemed um, that it seemed to me that who I thought I was, was who I was. And I think that's part of the problem of our upbringing is that we're taught you have a certain character. Some people are lazy, some people are honest, some people are hardworking, and none of that is true. <coughs> Those are just the outcome of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so we're never taught to recognize that we could be and experience absolutely anything we choose to. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge realization. So from then on, it, uh, there was no battle. Before there was no battle either. It was just a straight downhill path into destruction. Yeah, but I guess there's a lot of suffering though. That's what I meant by battle. Yeah, the suffering, um, I mean, looking back at it, I can't go there anymore because I, I don't interpret anything as suffering. Mm -hmm. But there certainly was um, looking back at it and seeing others that seemed to be on a similar path as I was. Um, a lot of very deep, profound sadness and unhappiness and anger. And um, none of that is necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of it is just a thought. It's just a thought away. So is it part, I is it part of the program also recreating uh, the past? No, you don't recreate the past. But what we do, we have, a <coughs> we have a forgiveness process. And that forgiveness process takes you through feelings into the experience or memory of the first time you felt this particular feeling. Uh -huh. So let's say that uh, Peter slams the door while we're doing this interview and you have a slight reaction to that, then we would immediately say, okay, what was that reaction? How did that feel? 
And then we would take that feeling back to the first time you remember feeling it. Uh -huh. Now for some people that is in utero, which is extraordinary, for a lot of people it's between age of zero to eight. That's when the beliefs are all formulated and made and where the so-called character is set. Now having identified the feeling at that particular moment, um, in my case 65, 66 years ago, or 67 or 69 years ago, and then saying, okay, what was happening at that moment? Who was I in that setting? Who was the I that was upset about the door being slammed by that sound? And what was my interpretation of myself at that moment? Mm -hmm. And that interpretation develops into belief. It can happen in once, in one time, or it can happen over a period of time of repeated uh, upsets that it solidifies mm -hmm. into a belief. Once it's a belief, <coughs> you no longer have choice. Mm -hmm. You have no longer choice to choose differently because you're going to choose according to who you think you are always. The only choice you have then is to change the belief. There's no choice beyond that. So as long as I don't change my beliefs, I will act according to my beliefs. I will create evidence for who I think I am under all circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the bind. Yeah. And even if somebody, because you had a lot of self-hatred, so mm. I guess even if somebody brings love, you push that away, then you don't want Abs any of absolutely. that. You cannot handle anything good. No, it didn't mean a thing. So it's a vicious circle. It's a vicious for a circle, lot of us. exactly. Because we all have that to different degrees. Yep. We all have addictions, mm -hmm. don't we? Yep. We all, all have ways to numb ourselves. We're all addicted. We're, we're all addicted. We're all totally addicted to feelings. Uh, that's the addiction we have. The beliefs may choose um, issues such as substances or medication or sex or working too hard or driving too fast or whatever it is. That's the, those are the symptoms, but we never work with the symptoms. I'm not interested in the symptoms. I'm interested in the beliefs mm -hmm. that have chosen the feelings that you are experiencing. That is of interest to me because that can be changed. Symptoms, if you change symptoms, you're doing behavior modification and over time that will not work. Yeah. So we've had a lot of people, for example, that have been dry, uh, not using alcohol or drugs for years and still totally miserable because they didn't change who they thought they were. Yeah. So yes, they were behaving themselves um, with some spasmodic energy of I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, but they still hated themselves. Yeah. And that has to change. Yeah, and that's not the point. You're talking here about true, deep happiness and mm -hmm. connection with our own, s with our self. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So falling in love with the self, the capital S self, is what this is about. And what a lot of other work is about is falling in love with the small S self and making a small L self you like better. And we just don't do that. And what do you uh, mean? What's that part? Well, there's two parts of my mind. One is the small S self, the self I made up, that's uh -huh. all my beliefs, or the capital S self. And that is my higher self, that is whatever you want to call it, the loving part of my mind, mm -hmm. the part that's still connected to oneness, the, the part that's connected to God, for lack of another word. Uh, that part is the same and has never changed, has never been touched by anything that happened. And that just waits. That so waits. it's just the other part kind of uh, shadows that big self. Exactly. So the more we heal, the more we can exactly. the have our the big shadow, self shine. Exactly, the shadow withdraws and the big self is more and more apparent and of course the more I ask for guidance from the big self yeah. uh, the more that guidance is available. The guidance is always there yeah. but I have to ask for it. And you have to trust it too. You automatically trust it because I sure don't trust the other self. Uh -huh. I've had enough experience with that one. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, because, because part of the love, too, is, is, is trusting. Trusting, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people have, even re regarding the divine or God, have a lot of issues just in that regard. I mean, we all have so much conditioning and so many things, so many experiences. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable to see the point where we're all at when it can be so easy and so simple and so magic. <coughs> uh, you just said it. I think the, <coughs> the word easy applies to this work uh, to an alarming degree and people absolutely are afraid of how easy it is. The most common comment we get is it cannot be that easy. Yeah. And my response always is, well, what if it is? Yeah. Because it is that easy. It is simply a matter of changing your mind. It's uh, changing your mind and changing your thoughts and that is done through processing and uh, meditation, a lot of meditation practice. What happens <coughs> in meditation? 
In meditation, I simply do not follow a thought. So a thought comes up, a thought comes up, that's a beautiful car, I wish I had a car like that. Immediately followed by a thought, I wish I had more money, or immediately followed by a thought, and then I would be traveling. The first thought of, that is a nice car, is immediately looked at with love, recognized as meaningless, and let go. Uh-huh. And that is meditation. And so if I live that way, which I don't, but I certainly aspire practice to. and teach and aspire to, yeah. um, you cannot be have any other experience on pure joy. Yeah. Because there's no desire that comes in the way. Yeah. Desire blocks joy. The only desire that is permissible, quote unquote, is the desire for total peace. Because that will not give rise to additional desires. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's where meditation is for me. For other people, meditation is different things. And that's one thing about our teaching is that we don't ever say that this is true and you have to do this, otherwise you're in trouble. No, this is one path. Mm-hmm. Uh, it happens to be my path. It happens to be a path that saved my life uh, spiritually as well as physically, and it saved countless lives uh, spiritually and physically, but it doesn't have to be your path. Mm-hmm. So whatever path you're on, if that brings you happiness and joy, stay with it. If it doesn't, then start questioning it. Was it a gradual process for you? Or no, it was very quick and very sudden. Because it had to be. It was either that or an, another process was going to be just as quick. Yeah. And uh, so I was really at a point where it had to be something different. And a lot of our clients in that same place. Something has to change. Yeah. And enough. Enough. Well, what, what what I found beautiful about this is that spirituality, it, 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 all of this suffering, it, out of all the suffering emerged a, a new way of life that mm-hmm. is so much more fulfilling mm-hmm. and, and, and in such a natural high yep. and such a deep joy that is so nurturing and fulfilling to the heart. Some of us, I guess some of our soul need to go through those suffering, those deep suffering as yours chose to, mm-hmm. to be able to live now in this, in this is new, not new heaven, but new, you know, new, uh, new view of life, new, 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 new dimension, new planet, new, mm-hmm. new something. Totally new experience. More, co- way more colorful than yeah. before. Yeah. But I guess when you were, when <coughs> it's like it numbs, I guess, all those drugs and alcohol and all those addictions that we have numb ourselves from this realness. We, we're afraid to go into it, into this spirituality, into this deep connection. Who are we to feel that deep connection, you know? Yeah, that, I think it's, uh, I think all the, the abuse, the uh, substance abuse has two aspects. One is the, I'm trying to numb the self-hatred. I'm trying to kill the little self that I hate so much. But I think uh, what I've learned from all the people that come to the center, and a lot of them have been addicted to a number of substances, what they have in common is that they're all seekers. Yeah. And I think think that um, what substance abuse and substance addiction is, to a high degree, is a form, a misguided form of seeking for an alternate truth. There is an awareness of an alternate truth, and... There's no way of accessing it, and, and then we go down a path. And that path didn't lead to awareness of truth, but it did eventually, because it got to be so desperate. Yeah. And that I found so uh, an absolute common thread between everybody that comes to our center. Yeah. They're all aware of a truth that they desperately want to access and don't have the tools, but they know it's there. I think everybody does. I think everybody knows what love is. Yeah. At a deep level. And then, of course, the ego comes in and tells you what it, what it should look like and what it should be feeling like, etc. And that's not true. And that's the meditation aspect is where you learn to no longer listen to the ego and say, no, that's not true. I'm not doing that. Yeah. And it seems like it was even people that had this really huge potential, this sensitivity, but this really potential of deep connection mm-hmm. with a huge spiritual path that they're led particularly to those. Yeah. Because of how, I guess, uh, how we're embracing society too. I mean, society too has its role and need to change, doesn't it? Without well, blaming others, but there's still something that needs... But nothing will change society other than you and I change our minds. Yeah. And that will change society. And then it will spread from there. And it's amazing. When we started doing this work now, I don't know, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, whatever it is, 
it was absolutely off the wall, cutting edge, weird stuff that we were doing. <coughs> now it's mainstream. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody is talking about the same thing. I mean, if 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 uh, Eckhart Tolle is on um, Oprah, and Marion Williamson Williamson is on Oprah, that gives you an idea of how mainstream this work is. It's it's completely becoming more and more accepted. Doesn't mean that I and you practice it, and that's what has to happen. So the ideas are now accepted, but the implementation, the integration, has not taken place yet. Mm -hmm. And that is happening. I mean, that's that's my process to yeah. continue to integrate my work. That's why I teach. I only teach what I need to learn. Yeah. And I'm totally aware of that. So when clients come to the center, they're going to be working with what I'm working on. <coughs> now, fortunately, it often is the same thing they're working on, so it works. But it's not that I have an answer and you have to come to me for the answer and I'll fix you. That's absolutely not what we do. We do our own work. Mm -hmm. And the entire staff is doing their own work. And that makes it an amazing place. Yeah. And where you really feel the oneness too, I guess. Yes, you feel the oneness, you experience the oneness simply because you recognize that the differences that I'd like to perceive come from my self-hatred, from my belief in separation. If I believe in separation, I have to see Peter as differently, I see you as differently, I have to see that car as differently. The more I integrate the truth, the less I see those differences and the less I experience them. Uh -huh. And that's the, part, that's the fun part. So where if uh, a lot of our work is in, in groups, in circles, mm -hmm. and so there'd be 15, 10, 15, 20 people in a circle, you listen really carefully, you'll hear your own story from everybody. Mm -hmm. And you can watch them transforming their story. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the courage and the insight and the awareness that it can be done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm incredibly excited about group work. I used to do one-on-one -on -one work for years and years and years and years. And now, um, if I have a choice, I'd be in a group mm -hmm. every day, which I am. And why did you choose Costa Rica? Because part of the center, the center is there too? The you center, to the, the residential center is in Costa Rica. And I chose that for so many reasons. One, um, I was born in Indonesia on the island of Java at 2,500 feet on a, a volcanic lake. And guess what? That's where the center is on a volcanic lake at 2,500 feet uh, in the tropics. So that's one. It's <laughs> physical. It's a fish coming home, a salmon coming home. The other reasons are to take someone entirely out of their common environment allows openings of synapses which are closed. In other words, they suddenly see a toucan. You and I spoke about a toucan. People haven't seen a toucan. And when you say, what is a toucan? This, and you have to explain to them it's the little bird on the fr um, juicy f fruit loops or something like that <laughs> that has a toucan on it. That's the only experience they have. So they kind of an experience of colors and birds and insects and wildlife and air that is completely new mm -hmm. and therefore everything is cracked open. If we had the center here in BC, they'd see the same tree they used under. Mm -hmm. They don't see that tree in Costa Rica. So there's no connections back to an old path. Mm -hmm. It's all new. Uh, the climate is another one. That whole wall doesn't exist. So we're always outside, we're always uh, in nature, we're always hearing the birds and the wind and feeling the wind. That's a big one. The lake is a huge factor. It's beautiful, clean, fresh water, and water is uh, immensely healing, and so we use that a lot. We go to the hot springs, which is um, less than an hour away, volcanic hot springs, where you can sit under a hot waterfall and... That sounds all and, magic. And, and detox. Sounds like holidays. Well, <laughs> <coughs> that is unfortunately some people's misperception. It's not a holiday. It's incredibly intense. And yes, we have all those wonderful experiences, but they're all part of the process. Yeah. How long does it take, do you think, to... How long do you want it to take? That's the only question. Yeah. <coughs> so some people come for uh, the shortest visit has been a day and a half. And this individual got exactly what he needed, which was one statement about his self-worth, that his self-worth was intrinsic and unchangeable. And he said, that's all I need. That's all I needed to know, and he left and he's done. Other people are there for six months. Mm -hmm. It depends on the resistance. Yeah. The resistance comes from addiction to victim. So if I want to be the author of my own experience, I have to let go of victim. Mm -hmm. And we share the planet with six billion victims. Every one of us believes in a victimhood. They did it to me, you did it to me, the weather did it to me, I don't have enough money. Whatever the story, mm -hmm. it's always a victim story. And to let go of that is a challenge. 
because you don't know who you'll be. Once you let go of your victim position, mm -hmm. who are you going to be? Mm -hmm. No idea. And that's scary. And even if the victim position brings me nothing but misery, I'm still going to choose that over the unknown of the absolute bliss. Mm -hmm. And the absolute bliss is a scary concept, because in that absolute bliss, I don't exist. And my ego says, well, we're going to go very slowly with that one. And it's going to sabotage, and it's going to do whatever it can to yank me back from going into that absolute bliss. Mm -hmm. But that's where the game is. That's where the fun is. Mm -hmm. to that's say where no. the juice is. That's where the juice is. You so what is it for you now to live a juicy life? Uh, indescribable. I have, I have no words. It, uh, it's beyond anything I ever expected and beyond anything I ever thought possible. Uh, beyond anything I even imagined or, or heard other people living. Uh -huh. uh, because even if I heard from people who are living a far more glorious life than I live now, I wouldn't have believed it anyway. It didn't mean anything. So hearing somebody else's experience may give you an idea of what is possible for you, but it doesn't give you the experience. The only way to have the experience is to have it. Mm -hmm. And this is an amazing experience. Truly, truly remarkable. So what is the choice? It's a constant choice. Yeah. Every second of the day I choose between the thoughts. And if I pay attention to my thoughts, and there's about 60,000 a day of those, and I pay attention to them, then I choose ones that bring me love and joy. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't pay attention, then the other ones take over and start running my life. And I say, oh, there's something wrong. But the only thing that's wrong is I believe my thoughts briefly. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that ever goes wrong. Other than that, this is a benevolent world. Totally, absolutely benevolent. Mm. Well, thank you, Dietrich. Thank you so much for this moment. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for creating Choose Again. Thank you. Thank you. Much love, my beautiful co-creators from Vancouver. <laughs> Bye.